In episode 11, we talked about high blood pressure, what it is, how it happens, and the evil that it can do. In this episode, we're going to talk about the medical management of high blood pressure. The athlete of aging is at risk for hypertension, and it's one of the most common of chronic diseases. So if you're watching this and you're in your 40s or 50s or beyond, there's a pretty good chance that you're being treated for high blood pressure. But it's my experience as a physician that many, if not most people, who are being treated for hypertension have no idea what their medicines are doing, how they work, or what kind of unexpected effects they can have. So let's see if we can clear things up. Hi, I'm Jonathan Sullivan, and welcome back to Gray Steel. When a doctor diagnoses a prehypertensive state or mild hypertension, the first approach is going to be lifestyle modification. Less bad food, healthier levels of sodium and potassium in the diet, weight loss, stress reduction, and exercise. We're going to talk about the effect of lifestyle, and particularly exercise, in our third installment on hypertension. For now, we're going to focus on blood pressure medication because if hypertension is advanced enough or if it doesn't respond adequately to lifestyle interventions, then medication will be needed to keep the patient from blowing a gasket. But there are blood pressure medicines and there are blood pressure medicines. These antihypertensive agents come in a variety of flavors and they treat blood pressure by different mechanisms. The important thing isn't the mechanism or the particular drug itself, but rather that high blood pressure is controlled safely and with a minimum of side effects. At the end of the day, all antihypertensives do pretty much the same thing. They decrease the pressure in the arterial tree, usually by decreasing or inhibiting constriction of the blood vessels, or by actually promoting dilation of the blood vessels. Some agents have an effect on the heart, usually by decreasing heart rate. Remember, the blood pressure is determined by the TPR, or total peripheral resistance, and the cardiac output. And the TPR is determined primarily by how constricted or dilated the vessels are. The cardiac output is determined by stroke volume or how much blood the heart pumps with each beat, and by heart rate. So, we can lower blood pressure by affecting the constriction of the blood vessels, or the heart rate, or how hard and how much the heart pumps. In the United States, patients with newly diagnosed high blood pressure are often, but not always, started on a diuretic. A diuretic is simply a medicine that makes you pee. Probably the most commonly used diuretics in hypertension are the thiazide diuretics, like hydrochlorothiazide and chlorthalidone. These drugs inhibit the ability of the kidney to hang on to water in part by affecting the way the kidney handles salt and potassium. You pee more, so you have less blood volume, so your cardiac output goes down, so your blood pressure goes down. Or at least that's the idea. In chronic use, the thiazides are thought to have a direct effect on the TPR or the resistance of the blood vessels. Thiazides are fairly good drugs when used properly and in the right patients. And they're cheap, and some authorities don't believe that they're used enough for good cost-effective care. Like all drugs, diuretics have side effects, including dehydration, messed up serum electrolytes, dizziness, fatigue, muscle weakness, and so on. It should go without saying that any of these is a signal for you to go and talk to your doctor. Next, we come to several different classes of drugs that we can loosely lump together as blocking agents. The alpha blockers aren't used much at all for hypertension anymore, and they include medications like doxazosin, prazosin, fentolamine, and terazosin. If you're on one of these medicines, it's more likely that you're on it for a big prostate or some other indication than for high blood pressure. Alpha blockers cause relaxation of the smooth muscles of the arterioles, thereby decreasing vascular resistance and lowering blood pressure. Like other antihypertensives, these drugs can cause dizziness, primarily through postural hypotension, a drop in blood pressure when you stand up. Not great. Beta blockers, 
like atenolol, metoprolol, and carvedilol are another very commonly used form of blood pressure medicine. Like alpha blockers, beta blockers block a particular kind of adrenergic receptor. But in this case, it's the beta adrenergic receptors, a very important class of signaling proteins found throughout the body with wide-ranging physiological effects. Like the alpha receptors, these beta receptors respond to molecules called catecholamines, including epinephrine and norepinephrine, which signal the fight-or-flight response when your sympathetic nervous system is lit up. So, catecholamines increase heart rate, increase blood pressure, release glucose and fat into the bloodstream, and basically just get you all ramped up to do battle or deal with a tax audit. Beta blockers prevent catecholamines from talking to their beta receptors, literally blocking the receptor site. And so they tend to put a stop to all of that. Your body ramping up, that is. They stop that. They won't help with the audit. In general, beta blockers lower blood pressure, decrease heart rate, and make it harder to mobilize glucose and fat. So they can definitely treat hypertension, but their fairly broad physiological effect can cause lots of side effects. Slow heartbeat, fatigue, dizziness, blood sugar problems, wheezing, insomnia, and sexual problems, including erectile dysfunction. Some beta blockers are more cardioselective, more targeted to the cardiovascular system than others, and have a better side effect profile as a result. Even so, and while beta blockers are still valuable agents in the right situation, they are no longer considered even close to first-line therapy for hypertension. And they need to be used with great care in people who exercise intensely because of the effect that they can have on blood pressure, heart rate, and serum glucose and fat availability. You need to discuss all of this carefully with your doctor. Drugs like amlodipine, diltiazem, verapamil, and many others are calcium channel blockers. Calcium channel blockers work by, get this, blocking calcium channels. This is a big deal because calcium is the magic metal of biology. It does all kinds of important stuff. One of the wonderful things calcium does is to serve as the final step in signaling blood vessels to contract in response to, say, catecholamines. When properly stimulated by an upstream signal, calcium channels open up and let calcium flow into cells, like the smooth muscle cells lining your blood vessels. The influx of calcium into any kind of muscle cell stimulates contraction. Contraction of the smooth muscle and blood vessels causes them to constrict, raising blood pressure. Calcium channel blockers prevent calcium from entering the smooth muscle cell, and so inhibit constriction, lowering blood pressure. And it should go without saying that these cartoons are simplified illustrations of the concepts. I put them together more for clarity than for detailed physiological accuracy. Like, for one thing, in reality, these medicines work from inside the blood vessel, not from the outside. So, onward. Like beta blockers, calcium channel blockers have diverse effects because calcium channels are integral to so much of our biology. They tend to lower heart rate, but they can also paradoxically increase heart rate. They can lower the force of cardiac contraction, and they can cause dizziness, constipation, edema, and fatigue. Some calcium channel blockers are more specific in their effects, and some are used primarily to treat certain heart and neurological conditions rather than high blood pressure. Like beta blockers, some calcium channel blockers should be used with great care in people who engage in intense, vigorous exercise because of their ability to inhibit and increase in heart rate. ACE inhibitors are drugs like captopril and enalapril. ACE, A-C-E, stands for angiotensin converting enzyme. So ACE inhibitors block this enzyme from working. In the first episode on hypertension, I told you about angiotensin, which works at its receptors, here labeled AR, and tells blood vessels to constrict, thereby increasing the blood pressure. Angiotensin begins its life as angiotensinogen, which must be converted 
to angiotensin I, which must in turn be converted into angiotensin II, the final active form. This last conversion is carried out by angiotensin converting enzyme, or ACE. So ACE inhibitors block the enzyme and decrease the production of angiotensin II, thereby decreasing blood pressure. Pretty nifty, and these medicines can be very effective and are usually well tolerated. They don't decrease heart rate, and they're widely used not only for high blood pressure, but also for heart failure, certain kinds of heart attack, and diabetic kidney disease. Unfortunately, like all drugs, ACE inhibitors have side effects. Dizziness, low blood pressure, muscle weakness, high blood potassium, and others. They are associated with birth defects, and they should not be taken by pregnant women. The two most notorious complications of ACE inhibitor therapy are a dry cough, which can be very persistent and troublesome, and angioedema. Angioedema is a sudden, unpredictable reaction that can occur in people who have tolerated ACE inhibitors for a very long time. And then one day, you wake up looking like this. Angioedema can be life-threatening, and once it happens, you're off ACE inhibitors for good. At that point, your doctor may switch you to an ARB. ARBs are angiotensin receptor blockers, and they include drugs like telmosartan, valsartan, and losartan, among others. Like ACE inhibitors, ARBs work at the level of the renin-angiotensin system. It's just that, instead of preventing angiotensin production, they block the angiotensin receptor, so angiotensin can't talk to blood vessels and make them constrict. So, blood pressure goes down. Pretty simple. Side effects include rash, diarrhea, muscle aches, high potassium, kidney problems, and others. You may have heard about concerns that these drugs can affect the risk of cancer and heart attack, but this data is very preliminary and controversial. If your doctor thinks that you'll do well on an ARB, for now there's no good reason not to use these medications. Finally, Alpha blockers are drugs like clonidine, or catapress, and methyl dopa, or aldamet. These drugs talk to alpha-2 receptors in the brain, not in the blood vessels, and they don't block those receptors, but rather stimulate them. Through complex signaling, this action causes dilation of the blood vessels and a lowering of the blood pressure. Alpha agonists have other uses in medicine beyond high blood pressure, but for hypertension, they're not anybody's favorite anymore. They have a huge side effect profile, including sedation and a rebound withdrawal syndrome. Clonidine, or catapress, is notorious for this. Missing just a couple of doses can result in extraordinary rebound spikes in blood pressure. So high, it's been known to make primary care docs soil their undies. These alpha agonists are older, more primitive drugs. But they're still in use, although hardly considered first-line or even fifth-line therapy for high blood pressure. And some doctors, like me, really don't think that there is much use for them, except in very unusual, particularly difficult cases. Now, there are other classes of antihypertensives, like vasodilators, renin inhibitors, and endothelin blockers. There's even talk of hypertension vaccines. These aren't in widespread use at this time. The meds we've just discussed are by far the most commonly used for high blood pressure. What blood pressure medicine is best for the athlete of aging? I can't emphasize enough that that, ultimately, is a determination to be made by your doctor and you in an exercise of shared decision making. Your doctor needs to explain to you the pros and cons of the various medication options, including side effect profiles. And you need to make sure he knows all of your other medications, stuff about your diet, supplements, lifestyle choices, habits, and exercise selections. The best antihypertensive therapy will be a drug with a long half-life, minimal cardiac and metabolic effects, and a good side effect profile. In my experience, aging adults who are engaged in vigorous training tend to do better on ACE inhibitors and ARBs because they tend to have less effect on heart rate and a somewhat better side effect profile. But these aren't the only considerations, and your particular clinical situation may very well mandate other choices. The selection of the correct antihypertensive regimen is not a question that we can settle with broad pronouncements, particularly 
in a short YouTube video. You have to work with your doctor on this. But here's the thing. When you and your doctor decide on a blood pressure medicine, you need to take it, stick to it, give it a chance. Many side effects are temporary and your body will adapt over time. No matter what, if you have high blood pressure not responsive to lifestyle modifications alone, you need to be on an antihypertensive. And you must never suddenly stop taking your blood pressure medicine without your doctor's knowledge. That can lead to a dangerous spike in blood pressure and much badness. Please, don't do that. For some athletes of aging, antihypertensive medicines will be a fact of life. But the key word is life because controlling your blood pressure can prevent some of the most catastrophic cardiovascular events like stroke, heart attack, kidney and eye damage, and dissection. Antihypertensive medications aren't a curse. They're one of the great blessings of technological civilization. If you need them, take them and give thanks that you live in a world where they're available to help you live a longer, healthier life. In part three of our series on hypertension, we'll talk about the impact of exercise on high blood pressure. So please do join us then. Thanks for watching this episode of Grace Teal. Our content is offered for educational and infotainment purposes only and will never be presented as medical advice for any particular person, patient, disease, or condition. If you have questions about your health, you should work closely with your physician. I'd like to thank my colleague, Dr. Matt Atkin, for his very helpful comments on the draft version of this episode. Thanks, Matt. A big shout out to our newest patrons on Patreon, Chris Lipke, Carson and Christine Laufer, Walter Wilkins, and Elrook Williams. If you'd like to help them help us make more of these videos, just go to patreon.com slash and become a patron. Or if you just want to keep learning new stuff about healthy aging, go to youtube.com slash and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That really helps us out a lot too. Until next time, stay strong and stay healthy.